Hi, today I'm talking about crucial conversations, tools for talking when there's high stakes, strong emotions, and opposing opinions. And how do you get results from those crucial conversations? I'm going to be touching on some of the pitfalls when you face a crucial conversation, and what are some things that you can do to be more effective so that you can ultimately solve your problem and get better results. Picture this. You're with your team and you've been planning a project plan and you finally come up with a project plan that you all agree on and you know can deliver a quality product on time and will hit budget. And everyone agrees that in order to do that you need to follow the project plan. Fast forward a few months. You start to notice something. You start to notice that your boss and your boss's boss still maintain that everyone must follow the project plan except for them and they skirt the process, ensuring that your project won't get done on time and hit budget. So your next staff meeting, your boss is talking, and your boss, by the way, has a very bad temper, and they do not like to hear bad news. Your boss says, does anyone have any concerns about the project plan? What do you do? What do you do in that moment? What do you say? Well, many of us stay silent. We don't say anything, because we're thinking about the costs of speaking up. If I speak up, gosh, I heard we're downsizing. I don't want to get any extra attention drawn to myself. I don't want to get any more work. They might say, hey, great idea. Why don't you go solve all our problems? Or you might get the wrath of your boss's temper. And we stay silent. What we rarely do is we rarely think about what are the costs if I don't speak up. And there's a real cost when we don't ask ourselves that question. What is the cost from staying silent? Let me give you another example. We do a lot of work in the healthcare system, and we do a lot of work with hospitals, and we were called into a hospital that was having lots of problems. They had very high turnover rates among their nurses. They had very high infection rates, and it all came to a head when a woman came in for surgery, and she had a flawless foot amputation. Everything went according to plan, and she's coming back from her surgery, and she looks down at her foot, and she starts to scream as her anesthesia is wearing off, and she's, her nurse runs in and can't calm her down, and she calls the doctor in, and the doctor can't calm her down. She's still screaming. And the doctor and the nurse go over, and they look at her chart. And this is a true story. And they look at her chart, and she'd been checked in for a tonsillectomy, and they'd incorrectly amputated her foot. What would it have taken to stop that from happening? What would it have taken to have this woman not spend the rest of her life with a fake foot? What would it have taken one person to say, this isn't the right surgery. And in fact, when we went into the hospital, we found that seven people saw something wrong and said nothing. From the anesthesiologist wondering, why am I administering these kinds of drugs for this kind of surgery? To the nurse's assistant wondering, why am I putting these knives out for this kind of surgery? And they did a mental calculus. They said, well, I don't want to be the one to, you know, had the surgeon yell at me, and I don't want to hold it up. I don't want to hold up the surgery. We have five more to go today. And they said, what's the cost if I speak up? You think, why would five well-intentioned, well-trained, well-educated people not speak up? They thought about the costs of speaking up. But it doesn't just happen in the hospital. It happens in the workplace. 90% of U.S. workers currently say they're working on a project that they know will fail. Maybe that applies to some of us in the audience. But few of us speak up. I mentioned project skirting earlier, where you circumvent the process to get your own agenda completed and you end up messing up the whole project plan. 83% of leaders say they encounter that problem, but only 13% say they can speak up effectively to address that problem. We're not very good at speaking up, and it affects our health. New York Times recently did a study, and they were looking at arguments with couples, and they were trying to figure out, do people who speak up and say what they really think and feel, are they, do they have any, does anything different happen than those who don't speak up and say what they really think and feel? They were looking particularly at the women, and what they found was that women who did not speak up and say what they really thought and felt during arguments with their husbands were four times more likely to die during the course of this 15-year study. Now, my last audience, a guy stood up and he says, my wife's going to live forever. <laughs> but the point of this is that when you don't speak up, it affects your health. 
Now, some of us aren't so shy, and we speak up. And what that might look like is it might be a sarcastic comment. We hope people will read between the lines. We lash out. We explode. And it doesn't go so well either. Take a look at this conversation. Shut up! No, you little wimp! You get out of that room or I'm going to tell. Fruitcake, where do you think you might hear this conversation? Right over here it in the schoolyard, perhaps? Or in your house? Well, it's actually happened in a different kind of house. It's actually a conversation at the meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee in uh, 2003, according to the USA Today. So even our top leaders sometimes resort to ineffective, crucial conversation skills. What I want to talk to you about today is what do you do in the face of this? When you know that other people are likely to clam up or explode, what can you do? One of the differentiating skills that sets the best apart at crucial conversations is their ability to make it safe. Now, when I say that, I don't mean make it safe from a punch coming or some invisible force field. I just mean make it safe to have a discussion about tough issues. How can you talk about really challenging issues and have a dialogue about it to where the other person doesn't get defensive or you don't lash out. And the promise is, is that if you can make it safe, you can talk to almost anyone about almost anything. When I first heard this claim, I thought, I don't know, I don't, I don't buy it. Because I was going through mediation training for the DC Superior Court for child abuse cases. And I thought, how is it possible to have a conversation when these parents have just had their, pa their children taken away from them, and there's often very shameful allegations of sex abuse, physical abuse, and neglect, how are we supposed to have a conversation, a dialogue? And what I quickly learned is that if you can apply the skills for Make It Safe, you really can talk to almost anyone about almost anything. But it's not always easy. There's two main pieces to Make It Safe. Mutual respect and mutual purpose. I'm going to break each one down and touch on them briefly. In mutual respect, it's pretty basic. Show respect for someone. It's kind of like oxygen, I think. You know, it's in the room, we don't even notice it, but the second it's gone, you, you can't talk anymore. So how can you make sure you have respect? Well, the challenging piece there is that often you're having crucial conversations with people you don't have much respect for because they're the ones who've let you down, who've missed deadlines, who have Bad had bad behavior, and so you're not feeling very respectful of them in the moment. And so the question that people often give me is, how do you respect somebody you don't respect? I faced this myself in my first mediation. I was reading the case, and it was a woman who had six children, and there were very strong allegations of sex abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. There were several fathers involved. Mom was on drugs, and I wanted her to pay. How dare she do this to her children? I want her to be thrown away in the slammer, throw away the key, and I'm the mediator. So do you think that might affect my ability to facilitate a dialogue where she feels comfortable, where she feels respected, and we can actually talk about the issue and move the family forward? Absolutely. And so I knew I wouldn't be a very effective mediator. So what I did is I went back and I reread the case. And what I found out was that she had just gotten out of the foster care system herself. She had been abused her whole life. And I didn't have a 360. I didn't totally flip everything and say, oh my gosh, so I want to be her best friend. But I had a significant shift of my heart to where I said, this woman deserves me to respect her dignity. You know, this is someone who needs help, and I want to just respect her as a person. And I'm confident that that shift, even though slight, was a significant shift that needed to happen in order for us to have a very productive mediation that helped move that family forward. I'll give you another example. One of the authors was recently on a flight, Joseph Grenny. And he sat next to a gentleman. They started talking about what they both do for a living. And the gentleman next to him was a hostage negotiator. He says, wow, hostage negotiation, what's that like? What do you have to do to prepare? He says, well, the first thing I have to do to prepare is I have to Take, I have to think about that person on the other end of the phone as somebody's mother, somebody's brother, somebody's daughter or son. So because if I can't find a place in my heart to, to humanize that person, to find some respect for that person, they're going to hear that disrespect in my voice. And in the first 20 seconds, 
they'll hang up and they won't talk to me. So I have to find a place in my heart to humanize them so that we can actually dialogue. Now what I'm not saying is that we let these people off the hook, that we're overlooking what happened. In order to hold these people accountable, we need to be able to dialogue. And so we need to find that respect in order to have that dialogue. It has to be genuine. The second piece to this is mutual purpose. How can you convey that you care about what that person cares about as well? But again, the challenge here is often you say, well, we don't care about the same things. That's why we're struggling here. That's why we're in a crucial conversation. We care about totally different things. Let me give you a couple examples. Several years ago, uh, the peace accords were happening in Camp David. And it was President Carter, Prime Minister of Israel, and the President of Egypt. They'd been meeting for 13 days with no progress and no agreement. Thinking, gosh, no one cares about what I care about. No one cares about what my country is struggling with. You know, we all care about different things, and I'm going to dig my heels in because I don't feel like our needs are being heard. Well, a few days earlier, the Prime Minister of Israel had asked President Carter if he would autograph photos of the three of them so he could give it to his grandchildren. What President Carter did is he went and he did some research, and he found out the names of the Prime Minister's grandchildren, found out all their names, and autographed each photograph separately. At this particularly toxic point in the negotiations, President Carter pushed the photos across the table. The Prime Minister grabbed the photos, and he started to read each one aloud separately, reading each of his grandchildren's name, Uri, Adele. And according to the historians, his voice started to quiver. And him and President Carter started to talk about family and grandchildren and war and what it's like to raise a family in war. And they attribute that point to the turning point of the peace accords. And that afternoon, they signed the peace accords. How can you create mutual purpose? How can you create common ground? You know, it might just be as simple as if you're talking at work and you're having an argument and you can't find any ground, to just say, you know, we both want to get out of here by 5 o'clock tonight. Mutual purpose. You know, we both want to do what's best for our customers. Mutual purpose. And when you can do that and combine it with genuine respect, you're going to be well on your way to making it safe, which is an underpinning for starting out a healthy, crucial conversation. There's many challenges in crucial conversations. If you can make it safe, you can talk to almost anyone about almost anything and be on your way to getting the results to solve your problems. <laughs>